Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Hey, uh, it's time for Unearthed. Ta-da! Because we started doing this quarterly. And uh, it's a strange and interesting thing because it feels a little weird to do something that's just part of the normal calendar right now. So we're recording this just as a random note. Stuff's moving so fast in the world right now. We are recording this on April 7th. And I don't think it's coming out until two weeks after this, approximately. So heaven only knows what will be discovered between now and then. (laughs) Well, and also, who really knows what will be happening in the world when this comes out on, I think, April 20th and 22nd. Like, it's it's a it seems like a million years from now, as fast as things have been going. Um, That's aside from what I was really going to say, which is that when we do these episodes, some of the things that we are talking about are discoveries that literally just happened. They happened just now. They were announced right away. Sometimes it is published findings from digs that happened months or years earlier or analysis of something that was happened a long time ago but only studied recently. So it's like the the paper is what has recently happened. Either way, it seems likely at this point that when we get to July, our middle of the year unearthed, which has been a two-parter for the last couple of years, might have a little less to report given the coronavirus pandemic. So uh, I'm just going to enjoy this wealth of unearthed things while we have it. (laughs) Uh, In today's episode, we have some stuff that was reported during the last two weeks of 2019, which missed the cutoff for the year-end unearthed episodes. We also have some episode updates, some crime, animals, and games. And then next time, we're going to have the edibles and potables and the shipwrecks and the repatriations along with other stuff. Kicking off with stuff that really came from the tail end of 2019, Brian Furry, archival researcher for the Making Gay History podcast, unearthed what may be the oldest audio recording ever made of activists Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera. It's an interview conducted in 1970 by Liza Cowan of the New York City radio station WBAI when Rivera was 19 and Johnson was just 25. The tape containing this interview was in the basement of the Lesbian Her Story archives in Brooklyn, New York. And the uh, tape was just marked STAR. That stands for Street Action Transvestite Revolutionaries. That was the name of the organization that Johnson and Rivera founded in 1970. The interview was released as a bonus episode of the Making Gay History podcast, which is an oral history podcast hosted by Eric Marcus. Uh, This bonus episode came out on December 27th, 2019, and it also includes some conversation with Brian Furry about finding this tape, like the actual process of the unearthing of the tape. We also did an episode on Sylvia Rivera, which includes information about Johnson and their work with Star in 2014. Underwater archaeological excavations have uncovered the remains of a 7,000-year-old seawall off the coast of Israel. According to a paper called A Submerged 7,000-Year-Old Village and Seawall Demonstrate Earliest Known Coastal Defense Against Sea Level Rise, published in December, it is the oldest such structure ever to be discovered. So based on this team's analysis, Neolithic villagers built this wall, which is about 100 meters long, using boulders that had to be excavated from riverbeds as far as two kilometers away from the village itself. All of that sounds like just an immense undertaking to me. (laughs) Unfortunately, this seems to have offered the village only temporary protection. At some point, the village was flooded and abandoned, although it is not clear whether the villagers relocated ahead of the flooding or afterward. In other news, a team at the University of Oregon has concluded that human migration to the Caribbean islands progressed differently than has been previously and generally thought. For a geographical refresher, you can group the islands in the Caribbean very roughly into two groups, the Greater Antilles, which are the larger islands like Jamaica, Cuba, and Hispaniola, and then the Lesser Antilles, which are the smaller islands that extend generally southward from those larger ones. 
The prevailing view among most researchers has been that people started settling in the southern part of the Lesser Antilles at the spots that were closest to the South American mainland and then moved northward from there. This team came to the opposite conclusion, that they traveled to the farther away but larger Greater Antilles first and then moved south. They came to these conclusions after reevaluating 2,500 radiocarbon dating results from 55 Caribbean islands. They also concluded that this migration probably happened in two primary waves. The first one about 5,800 years ago, and the second only 2,500 years ago. The team's paper on this was published in the journal Science Advances in December. Natalie Mueller and a team from Washington University in St. Louis has been studying ancient food crops that exist in the archaeological record but have no written or oral histories describing how they were grown and used. In other words, we know these crops existed thanks to archaeological specimens, but we really don't know what it took to cultivate them properly or how people used them for food. Yeah, if folks think that all you have to do is stick a seed in the ground and it grows, like, that works for some seeds. <laughs> Definitely not all of them. Uh, And in this case, archaeologists in the 1930s had found seed caches and dried leaves in rock shelters in Arkansas. And these seeds did not represent the maize, squash, and beans that are a well-known staple of indigenous cuisine in that part of North America. So that left a whole lot of questions about exactly what kind of seeds these were and how people grew and used them before those other three foods became such important staples. After meticulous efforts to get these seeds to germinate and grow, Mueller figured out how to grow two plants, goosefoot and erect knotweed, and realized that these two plants have a higher yield when they're grown together than they do if one is grown separately from the other. It's possible that they were as important to indigenous diets as maize eventually became. In Mueller's words, quote, The main reason I'm really interested in yield is because there's a debate within archaeology about why these plants were abandoned. We haven't had a lot of evidence about it one way or the other, but a lot of people have just kind of assumed that maize would be a lot more productive because we grow maize now. And it's known to be one of the most productive crops in the world per unit area. The paper that came from all of this is Experimental Cultivation of Eastern North America's Lost Crops, Insights into Agricultural Practice and Yield Potential. And that was published in December in the Journal of Ethnobiology. And for our last unearthed thing that was really from December, in late December it was announced that a cord found near the body of Utsi the Iceman was a bowstring made from animal fibers, It's now believed to be the oldest bowstring ever found. So that is both something from late 2019 and our regularly scheduled Utsi update because there's always something new about Utsi. Always. Uh, Utsi is the gift that keeps on giving. Let's take a quick sponsor break uh, and then we'll do some of the updates of previous episodes. In July of 2019, we did an episode on Thomas Cook and the rise of the tourism industry. Just two months later, the Thomas Cook group collapsed, leaving travelers stranded around the world. And a question that followed, which is one that happens with a lot of businesses when they go under, especially large businesses that have been around for a really long time, was how to save the company's archive. And this wasn't just about nostalgia for old stuff. Company archives can document not only a company's own history, but also the time and place in which the company operated and its customers and employees. They can be truly immense sources of historical information. In the case of Thomas Cook, that archive included a wealth of written records, passenger lists, brochures, letters, books, and other material that the company produced. So a panel was convened in November of 2019 to figure out what to do with this archive. And in January 2020, it was announced that the Thomas Cook archive would go to the record office for Leicestershire, Leicester, and Rutland. When the announcement was made public, the collection itself had already been moved. So it was accompanied by pictures of, like, where all the boxes are now. (laughs) Previous hosts did an episode on Cahokia on June 8th, 2011. The general consensus on Cahokia has been that the Mississippian peoples who built it abandoned it sometime in the mid-14th century, and that it remained abandoned from that point. 
However, according to a study published in the journal American Antiquity, while the Mississippian peoples who had lived on the site did abandon it around that time, it was repopulated in the 1500s, with people continuing to be present there for at least 200 more years. These conclusions were based on analysis of things like fossil pollen, charcoal, and fecal remnants. Particularly important to this work were fecal stanols from the sediment at the bottom of Horseshoe Lake. And this is not the first time that we have talked about fecal remnants in Horseshoe Lake. In Unearthed in July 2019, we talked about a team that analyzed the lake's sediment layers, including fecal components, to trace how the human population at Cahokia had changed in response to things like environmental and weather conditions. We did an episode on the Hartford Circus Fire in March of 2015, and we have done various updates since then about efforts to identify remains of some of the victims. This included exhuming bodies from Northwood Cemetery to analyze their DNA. In particular, the bodies of two women were exhumed to try to confirm whether either of them was Grace Dorothy Smith Fifield, who is still classified as missing. However, based on a report from February, neither set of remains is a match to Fifield's living granddaughter. So it's possible that back in 1944, Fifield's remains were misidentified and released to the wrong family. The state of Connecticut has turned to the DNA Doe Project to see if they can find a match among people who have used DNA testing services for their own DNA. Currently, there are five sets of unidentified remains buried in Northwood Cemetery, and six victims of the fire are still listed as missing. Efforts to identify remains are still ongoing, but it is a time-consuming process, in part because those remains were so badly damaged in the fire. Moving on to the ongoing saga of efforts to exhume John Dillinger's remains, Uh, members of the Dillinger family who had taken the matter to court withdrew their lawsuit in January. So, for the moment, this matter is settled and the remains will not be exhumed. However, an attorney representing Dillinger's nephew issued a statement that this nephew could still file a new challenge at some point in the future if he chose. A previous host's episode on Dillinger came out on December 5th, 2011. We actually, in a rare set of circumstances, do not have a standalone exhumation section in this edition of Unearth because those two were really the biggest stories. I think part of the reason is, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, the months from Winter. December <laughs> through March are, like, not as conducive to getting into the ground. Uh, during Unearthed in October 2019, we talked about Seamus Blackley, who had traveled to the Museum of Fine Arts Boston and the Peabody Museum of Anthropology and Ethnology at Harvard to collect samples of ancient yeast. And then he made bread with what he hoped was that ancient yeast and not contamination with modern yeast. He tweeted a thread on Twitter about that bread that he made that we talked about back in October. On March 29th of this year, he tweeted another thread about how he had made bread, quote, with leavening cultures sampled from ancient Egyptian baking vessels using ancient emmer wheat with an ancient Egyptian recipe and using ancient Egyptian baking tools and no oven. He did this under embers in a cooking pit. It was, like the last batch, delicious, according to Blackley's report, and DNA analysis of the yeast starter is still forthcoming to confirm whether it really is ancient yeast. That part is really, really tricky. There is wild yeast around us all the time. Yeah, I'd, I've seen several people share threads about how to try to collect wild yeast to make a starter, Yeah, as there have been some yeast shortages <laughs> During the (laughs) pandemic. I have yeast guilt related to this because I don't do a lot of baking, but I bought yeast just by accident. Yeah. (laughs) Shortly before this all started because I was wanted to try a a bread recipe in a cookbook that I have. And so I have this tiny jar of yeast in my fridge that I feel so guilty for having. Um, (laughs) I feel like I need to make bread immediately. We have a, a bread machine, which someone gave to us, that we had not used in the year since moving here. And I was just at the point where I was like, should we get rid of this bread machine? We have not used it in a year. And then the pandemic was declared and it was much harder to get to the store and buy bread. Um, And just coincidentally, I had bought a thing of bread machine yeast sometime earlier this year, I guess. So it's like we've been making our own bread in the machine. Nice. Uh, I also have some yeast guilt, although I am, we are making it like at least once a week, we're making a loaf of bread. 
Anyway, that is not using ancient Egyptian techniques and tools. <laughs> that's literally using a machine that's doing it for us. Uh, so, uh, this this next thing is on a much more serious note. It is not exactly an episode update, but the Wampanoag tribes have come up in a couple of recent episodes of our show, including Paul Cuffey and King Philip's War. On March 27th, the U.S. Secretary of the Interior, David Bernhardt, issued a decision that the Mashpee Wampanoag's 300 acres of reservation land on Cape Cod would be taken out of trust and the reservation would be disestablished. The federal government had taken the land into trust in 2015, but afterward, two federal courts issued rulings that the government had not had the authority to do that. The Mashpee Wampanoag tribe had a separate suit filed that was still pending when the Department of the Interior's decision was announced. The tribe itself was and continues to be federally recognized. Tribal Council Chairman Cedric Cromwell was quoted as saying, quote, It feels like we've been dropped off into a new world we've never seen before, i.e. in this pandemic and the way my tribe is being treated. With this happening now, this is a direct hardcore blow to dissolving and disestablishing my tribe. Cromwell and others involved also criticized the Department of the Interior for issuing this decision at 4 o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday during a pandemic. Representative Bill Keating, who represents the congressional district where the reservation is located, called the decision, quote, one of the most cruel and nonsensical acts I have seen since coming to Congress. The secretary should be ashamed. Keating is also one of the sponsors of a bill called Mashpee Wampanoag Tribe Reservation Reaffirmation Act, which has passed the House but not the Senate. That act would reaffirm the tribe's reservation status. As of the moment that we are recording this, it is really not clear what happens next. Many of the tribe's projects had been put on hold because of the pandemic, including the establishment of a school that's part of the effort to revive the Wampanoag language. Obviously, a lot of the services that would have been helpful in negotiating this process are also non-essential or considered non-essential and are not operating. Um, It is a deeply uncertain time for the tribe and its reservation land. In our 2019 year-end unearthed, we talked about results of ground-penetrating radar scans that were used to look for signs of mass graves associated with the 1921 massacre in Greenwood, also known as the Tulsa Race Riot. We did an episode about that massacre in 2014, and we reissued it as a Saturday classic last year during the run of HBO's Watchmen TV series, which had several connecting points to that massacre. The city of Tulsa announced plans to do a test excavation at Oaklawn Cemetery. That was one of the locations where ground-penetrating radar had revealed signs of a possible mass grave something that we talked about on a previous edition, as we said, of Unearthed. Uh, At the last update, that excavation was planned to start on April 1st and go on for 10 days. However, the excavation has had to be postponed. We are not sure until when because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Also earlier this year, the state of Oklahoma announced that it will require the massacre to be taught in schools. Continuing on the more serious thread of topics, Uh, And unearthed in July 2019, we talked about a discovery made by Hannah Durkin of Newcastle University. Durkin had published a paper on a woman named Radoshi who had died in 1937 and was believed to be the last survivor of the transatlantic slave trade in the United States. Previously, the last known survivor had been a man named Kujo Lewis who died in 1935, so two years before Radoshi did. We also previously talked about the publication of Zora Neale Hurston's book, Barracoon, which came from an interview that she conducted with Kaja Lewis. Well, Durkin has now found that another person outlived both Radoshi and Kaja Lewis. That's Matilda McCreer, who died in Selma, Alabama in January 1940. She was 83 at the time. She, her mother, and her sister had all been enslaved in West Africa when Matilda was two, and they were transported to the U.S. on one of the last slave ships to arrive here in 1860. Just to repeat, because I feel like it's an important thing to keep in mind, the last known survivor of the transatlantic slave trade in the United States died in 1940. We are going to close out our updates with a couple of brief bits that were just fun. In our two-part podcast on the Lumiere Brothers from 2017, we talked about their 1895 short, Arrival of a Train at La Ciotat. 
YouTuber Denis Shiriev used neural networks and algorithms to upscale that film to 4K resolution at 60 frames per second. And it is really beautiful. Uh, this is an audio podcast, so we can't really convey how cool it is. I will say this. One of the, the cool things that I saw going around uh, on Twitter of people discussing this film is that we have always kind of giggled a little bit many modern era people about how funny it was that people of the time were startled by this piece of footage and mm-hmm. they're like oh but seeing it like this i totally see how that would have happened <laughs> <laughs> i think we talked in that episode about how probably that didn't really happen but just in case <laughs> right, right like they weren't scared and run right right and, and run away but even so i think most people were a little bit just like awed by it it's literally looks like a train coming at you and when we see it even with our modern eyes used to constant um technological advances in film and television seeing the way it's framed and the way it's filmed it really does feel for a second like a train is coming right at you yeah (laughs) it's quite striking yeah um as i was typing this in here i realized the sort of absurdity that i was typing into an audio podcast outline a video that you can watch on the internet. Uh, Anyway, lastly, just as a fun ending for these updates, nearly a hundred Girl Scouts took part in an archaeological dig at the birthplace of founder Juliet Gordon Lowe. I forgot to put in when we did that episode. It wasn't that long ago. You can find it in our archive. The dig was in advance of clearing the garden area at the birthplace for some new landscaping. And some of the items that they unearthed included household objects like nails. What a cool project. (laughs) That's what I thought. I love it. (laughs) Uh, Do you want to take a quick sponsor break before we dig into crime? Yeah, we're going to have some crime after the break. There's a lot of stuff in our unearthed episodes that you could classify as criminal in one way or another, including some stuff we've already talked about. But next up, we have a couple of things that fall under crime by a more straightforward definition like you maybe might hear about on a true crime podcast. First, on May 18th of 1916, a man named Joseph Henry Loveless escaped from custody in Idaho where he was being held on suspicion of having brutally murdered his wife. In January of this year, headlines broke that his remains had been identified. The first piece of the remains in question was found on August 26, 1979. That was just his torso, buried in a shallow grave in a cave and found by a family looking for projectile points. His hand was found nearby in 1991, which led authorities to conduct a more thorough search of the cave. That search unearthed other parts of the body. A part they never found was his head. Uh, In 2019, law enforcement went to the DNA Doe Project and tried to construct a family tree for these remains. And that connected them to one of Loveless's living grandchildren. A likely conclusion is that Loveless was murdered and dismembered in an act of retribution for the grisly murder of his wife. Uh, There are various ethical questions about things like the DNA Doe Project making connections between living people and acts of crime. I feel like that's a little bit outside the scope of what we can really talk about in the podcast, but I wanted to acknowledge (laughs) there are questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, Late March 29th or early March 30th in The Hague, Netherlands, Vincent van Gogh's painting Spring Garden was stolen from Singer Laren Museum, which was closed because of the pandemic. Seeing as how this happened during a pandemic and just days before we recorded this, there is no other information at this time, including whether any other artwork from the museum was stolen. Since this was an overnight thing, if this did happen on the morning of the 30th, that was Van Gogh's birthday. Can I just tell you, this is one of those news stories that just burned my butter. Like I, I, It doesn't shock me at all. <laughs> there, are, <laughs> there are so many news stories that make me angry, but this one just set me into fits of rage. It's like, just, just like, add insult to injury. Not only stealing a painting, but also stealing the painting on the artist's birthday. Well, and taking advantage of a global pandemic to do it. I just, <sighs> I feel ways. <laughs> There's a lot of layers there. Uh, It makes me so angry. We're going to move on to some hopefully less outraging things uh, involving animals. We have a whole collection of animal 
unearths things coming up. During our year-end unearthed in 2019, we talked about Iceland's now extinct but genetically distinct walruses. And today we have some more walrus news. According to research from the universities of Cambridge, Oslo, and Trondheim, it's possible that Greenland's Norse colonies disappeared around the 15th century in part because they had been overhunting the local walruses for their tusks. Walrus ivory was an important trade good in medieval Europe, and it seems as though, leading up to the 1400s, the animals the Norse people were hunting in Greenland were getting smaller and smaller, and were more likely to be female rather than male, and were also hunted from farther and farther north on the island, suggesting that people were running out of larger male animals to hunt closer to home. In the words of Dr. James H. Barrett from the University of Cambridge's Department of Archaeology, quote, Our findings suggest that Norse hunters were forced to venture deeper into the Arctic Circle for increasingly meager ivory harvests. This would have exacerbated the decline of walrus populations and consequently those sustained by the walrus trade. Barrett's co-author, Bastian Starr, also noted that this would not have been the only factor. Other things like the Little Ice Age and unsustainable farming methods and the Black Death also would have played a part. In 2018, a restoration project was completed on the altarpiece at the Basilica Cathedral in Cascaviejo, Panama, which is part of Panama City today, not far from the southern end of the Panama Canal. While doing this work, it was discovered that orchid bees had built their nest in the altarpiece more than 200 years ago. This is a very solitary, shy bee species. Typically, females build their nests far away from each other, and that can make it really tricky for scientists to study them. Like, the nests are by themselves hard to find and far apart. But during this work, restorers found at least 120 clusters of orchid bee nests in this altarpiece. Some of them predated a fire that happened in 1870 because they had been covered with gilding when the altarpiece was restored after that fire. Scientists analyzed the pollen that had been preserved in these nests, and they found that they represented 48 different plant species, which gave them a much clearer sense of the plant life around Panama City in the 19th century. Moving on, researchers studying 28,500-year-old fossils in the Czech Republic have found evidence that supports the idea of early dog domestication there. They used dental microware texture analysis, and doing that, they sorted the dogs, or dog-like animals, into two categories, the more wolf-like and the more dog-like The more wolf-like teeth had microwear patterns that suggested that they had been eating mostly soft foods, like meat from mammoths. The more dog-like teeth, on the other hand, had marks that suggested that their diet was a lot harder and more brittle. So things like bones and hard scraps that people fed to them. The researchers called the more dog-like animals proto-dogs, which is a very fun and cute name. (laughs) I liked it. I, d- I, don't, I don't mean to make their research sound not important, but that's adorable. <laughs> yeah, I, I really liked the proto-dog moniker, which is a very normal thing to call an animal in this context, but it still delighted me. Um, something else that delights me is middens. We have talked about middens a lot on the show. These are basically trash heaps where people have thrown their various cast-off broken stuff, and they often contain a wealth of information when archaeologists start studying them. But I do not think we have ever talked about ancient pack rat middens, which can preserve plant and animal materials for thousands or even tens of thousands of years. In the words of Michael Tesler, a postdoctoral fellow at the American Museum of Natural History, quote, rodent middens are powerful tools in paleoecology. We wanted to see how we could take this invaluable resource and expand its use to give us a big picture view of what life in the Americas was like 1,000, 10,000, or even 30,000 years ago and measure how it has changed in the time since then. In this particular study, researchers examined 25 pack rat middens that were between 300 and 48,000 years old. It was a big span. Some of them were from Ohio, and some of them were from northern Baja California, Mexico. And this was not a paper that was really meant to draw conclusions about human activity or impact in these two areas that were studied, at least not yet. In a lot of ways, this paper was more about what people are capable of doing now with this research and what could be possible with better technology and methods in the future. So, 
In the future, researchers could use these kinds of pack rat middens to get a sense of all kinds of things, including how humans have influenced the environment over tens of thousands of years and vice versa. That paper is called Paleo-Metagenomics of North American Fossil Pack Rat Middens, Past Biodiversity Revealed by Ancient DNA. Now, we have a quartet of game-related things to talk about. First up, a very pretty glass game piece has been unearthed on the island of Lindisfarne in Northumberland. It is about the size and shape of a gumdrop made of glass, dark blue with these swooping white accent lines and five white balls on the top, like oversized sugar sprinkles. Uh, Those five little balls on the top may meant that the piece is meant to represent a king. The game in question was probably the board game Toffel, and while various wood and bone Toffel pieces have been found from Britain and Ireland, there is only one other glass Toffel piece from there on record. This particular piece is about 1,200 years old, and although Toffel is associated with the Vikings, it was played all over Northern Europe, and researchers believe this particular piece is actually of British origin, predating the Viking invasion of Lindisfarne. Moving on, a paper published in the Journal of Egyptian Archaeology has examined a Senate board that has previously been in a collection, but nothing has been published about it. The game Senate was played in ancient Egypt for at least 2,000 years. It is a little like backgammon, and its rules stayed pretty consistent during all that time. There's been some variations in the game board, though. Some of the spaces contain decorative elements that signify special functions. Like, if you land on this space, you have to go back to the beginning. Kind of like games that we would play today. This particular board is the size and shape of a small table. Like, probably would have been used as a table-playing space. It's been in the collection of a museum in San Jose, California since 1947, but it was not included in recent comprehensive catalogs of Senate boards that have been found around the world. There's also very little known about exactly where this came from or who owned it. It just, it has no documented history before the the most recent person to buy it in like the 19th century. So, they have had to study this board in comparison to other boards that we know about, and it's possible that this one dates back to the 18th dynasty before the reign of Hatshepsut, and if that's correct, this would be the only board conclusively dated to that period. In 2012, a team at Sirts Basher Mound in Turkey found a game set made of colored stones, but some of the pieces were missing. They dated the pieces to 5,000 years ago, with the team that made the find describing it as the world's oldest figurative game set. There are older games, but this may be the oldest one whose game pieces are clearly meant to represent real objects, such as pigs, dogs, and pyramids. So the missing pieces from this set were found in a recent excavation. There is very little wear on the pieces, so the team has concluded that this was possibly a grave gift instead of something that was actually played with. And one thing that they still don't have is the board that these pieces would have been played on. That probably would have been made of wood, and it might have just rotted away at this point. I I feel this strange sense of bliss reading about this because... (laughs) Have you ever had that time where you find the missing pieces of a game? Yep. Now, project that across thousands of years of history. Um, And last up for games. Ball games were a big part of the Maya and Aztec societies and continue to be so among their descendants. A team excavating an archaeological site called Etlatongo in southern Mexico say they have found the second oldest ball court ever found in that part of the world. Up until this point, archaeologists have generally associated the earliest Mesoamerican ball games with communities living along the Gulf of Mexico and in the coastal lowlands. But Etlatongo is in the Oaxaca Mountains, and that suggests that ball was actually being played in the highlands earlier than previously thought. This team also found figurines at the site that may represent ball players, and their paper on the find was published in the March edition of Science Advances. Uh, And now we just have a little cool thing at the end. A little door was rediscovered during a renovation of the British House of Commons this year. Behind it was a lost 360-year-old passageway created for the coronation of Charles II. When it was first built, this passage was meant to allow coronation guests entry into a banquet. But from there, various people used it to get into the House of Commons, including Samuel Pepys. But eventually, this door was walled over. 
This door and the passage that it led to had been uncovered one other time in the last century, and that was while repairing bomb damage from World War II, but then folks just kind of forgot about it until just now. In the words of Dr. Hallam Smith, quote, as we looked at the paneling closely, we realized there was a tiny brass keyhole that no one had really noticed before, believing it might just be an electricity cupboard. This is just like my childhood dream, where you realize the little panel has has a little keyhole in it. And there's something secret behind there. (laughs) Um, Once they got back there, they found a small chamber leading into that hallway. And (laughs) part of of the chamber was covered in various graffiti left by Masons who had enclosed that particular room in 1851. Um, Apparently, these Masons were chartists. They were part of a working class movement that called for voting and parliamentary reforms. And it just cracks me up that they left this graffiti uh, within this little secret chamber in Parliament um, about the Chartist movement. (laughs) Cracked me up. I love it. We, when we have done renovations on our house, we always leave secret messages and things that are going to get walled over. (laughs) So good. Uh, Sometimes I'll have dreams that like we realize, oh, there's a door that we never opened in the house. (laughs) What's back here? I kind of like that this one is like, oh, yeah, we knew about that. We just forgot. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know. The articles that got shared are kind of spectacular because there's a photo in that was in a lot of them um, of somebody coming through the little door. And it's not a small enough door to be kind of creepy, but it is a small enough door to be charming, in my opinion. Um, It's not like when we were looking at houses and we opened a little door in an attic, and there was a creepy, a creepy teddy bear back there. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, do you have creepy or non creepy listener mail? I uh, I have non creepy listener mail. Um, it is from Caitlin, and I have I have a specific reason that I picked this one to read. Um, the title of the email is "Cats and Sewing." And Caitlin says, hi, Tracy and Holly. I teach preschool and am currently furloughed because tiny germ factories and chronic illness is a dangerous combo without adding a pandemic into the mix. I'm going a little stir crazy in the house without spending my days refereeing my kiddos. So I impulse bought a sewing machine. Her name is Rose Bertin. I learned to sew and made cool stuff as a theater major, but paused after graduation when I didn't have access to the costume shop anymore. My first project was a felt sharktopus for my cat named Sharktopus, also known as Sharky. See photo. Photos were great. Sharky is eight months old, and her favorite activities include trying to catch birds through the window, sleeping under the couch where I can't bother her as easily, and stealing nibbles of teriyaki sauce from my plate. She's fuzzy and sweet and has a white spot on her tummy from where she got shaved for her spay. In regards to Emily Dickinson poems having a cadence, the first time I ever heard that was from my dad, and I thought he was a genius. His other favorite trick was to swap the lyrics of Amazing Grace, Yellow Rose of Texas, and House of the Rising Sun. Eight-year-old me was suitably impressed and entertained. Please keep staying safe and healthy, Caitlin. Um, Caitlin also has some episode topic ideas in there. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for this email. I wanted to read it for so many reasons, besides the one that I thought of at first. Uh, I love that the sewing machine is named Rose Bertam. (laughs) I love the trick of swapping the lyrics of these different songs. Um, I have, uh, before uh, before I moved away from Atlanta, um, I had a friend who did open mics and would, like, riff on um, old songs and hymns, like, that just seamlessly move in and out with each other's, like, key and meter and all of that, and it was delightful and I loved it. Uh, but also, I have also gotten out my sewing machine recently, to make some masks because there's a pandemic happening and we are now being advised to cover our faces when we go out in public. And I forgot how challenging it can be to sew things with cats around. Oh yeah. I'm just used to it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, uh, I, because I do still have a sewing table, but like there's just not a great place in our house to put it. I thought about making like a sewing corner in our basement and that has not worked out for various reasons. So I'm, I, I brought the sewing machine to the, the, t- the table that we eat on and there's not a way to close that off from any cats. So <laughs> it was just like constant cat wrangling while making masks. Anyway, thank you so much, Caitlin, for that email. It really delighted me in a lot of ways. 
Um, As always, uh, we hope folks and their loved ones are as safe and healthy as as is possible. Um, Regardless of, of what's happening in your life right now, I really hope people are able to take as much care with themselves and to be as gentle with themselves as possible. I know it's a really hard time and a lot of folks are really struggling. Um, So our thoughts are with everyone. If you'd like to send us a note or some cat pictures or anything like that, we're at History Podcast at iHeartRadio.com. We're all over social media at Miss in History, and that's where you'll find our Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. And you can subscribe to our show in Apple Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.